Good morning. This meeting of the Baltimore City Council Health, Environment, and Technology Committee is now called to order. I'm Danielle McCray, Councilwoman Representative of Second District and also Chair of the Committee. In attendance, we have Councilman Mark Conway from the 4th District. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And also Councilman Christopher Burnett from the 8th District. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And also we have Sophia gabrin hewitt with the mayor's office. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And we have Matthew Peters, who is staffed to our committee. Before we get started, I'm just going to ask everyone, if you have not already done so, to please turn off or silence your cell phone. Today, the committee will hear resolution 22-0129-ARA, informational hearing 311 request for tenants facing chronic mold. For the purpose of inviting multiple city agencies and other interested parties to appear before the city council to discuss the number of 311 requests received from tenants facing chronic mold problems in their homes, the number of complaints from tenants of public housing, and the number from tenants of private landlords, the demographics of those making the complaints, if known, and how such requests are managed and how the city can better address and respond to reports of chronic mold in housing. For this hearing, we're going to start with brief opening remarks from the bill sponsor. Then we're going to hear from our agency representatives and have an opportunity for committee members to ask questions. After that, the public will have a chance to testify on the resolution. As always, I do want to start by thanking Council Member Burnett for re-engaging the council regarding this critical matter. Mold and housing is a multifaceted issue that has touched many of our city residents, most notably our most vulnerable. Without immediate remediation, its presence can have lifelong health impacts, even for the healthiest among us. Our children are more likely to develop asthma and spend more time in the emergency room and less in the classroom. We know that with climate change, we can expect more humid and wet conditions, only intensifying this persistent issue. Continued collaboration with our city agencies has and will continue to be paramount in seeing the development needed to eliminate this home-based health hazard. At this time, we're going to hear from our resolution sponsor. The chair recognizes Council Member Burnett. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, colleagues, and agency representatives. Um, uh, yeah, so I, the, you know, this is an issue that uh, has come up uh, pretty regularly in my district, uh, particularly. Uh, with uh, rental rental units, we're often getting calls from tenants concerned about the uh, wet and moldy conditions in their basements or other areas, air conditioned units. Um, we've had this in multifamilies, we've had it in townhouses, uh, row houses, uh, and so it's something that I thought one to better understand the scale and the scope, which is why we were looking for data for 311 calls, because often that's the the single or most common point of entry for most constituents to start when they're looking for help. Eventually, they many may find their way to a council office or to the mayor's office or calling an agency directly. Uh, but we know that they usually start with a 311 call, um, and and that's advisable so that we can kind of understand uh, how you know the, the the volume and and get a small picture, I think, or a pretty significant picture from. What, what I'm seeing in the agency reports on uh, where the calls are coming from, how frequently they're being called in. Um, and then also just trying to get a better understanding of how code enforcement uh, as well as um, other agencies work to inspect and, um, and, and sort of follow through. Uh, I do know, I am aware that there are issues with like mold testing. I mean, we've talked about that in, in previous hearings, um, but we just wanted to get a, a picture of where the problem lies, if there's areas that it's particularly bad, and just sort of what, what folks are seeing on the ground. And so we thought it was helpful, in addition to what the, the chair has already mentioned about just the general public health crisis that mold is uh, in, our, in our city, uh, and that so many people deal with every day, given um, climate change. And so with that, I'll hand it back to you, Madam Chair, for agency reports. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Burnett. Um, we're going to hear from our agency representatives at this time um, and for our committee members who have joined us today. Um, we're just asking that you hold your questions until we've heard from all, all the agencies. We're actually going to start with the 311 call center. Good morning, council members and guests. I'm Lisa Allen. I'm the director of 311. Um, I, we are in support of finding out if customers are experiencing mold issues. However, 311 does not have a direct service request for mold, but we do enter them under HCD, building maintenance, so that 
housing can investigate the issue. And thank you, thank you, Director Allen. We're gonna move on to the Department of Housing and Community Development. Uh, good, <clears throat> sorry. good morning, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. Alice Kennedy here, Commissioner of Housing and Community Development. I'm joined today by Deputy Commissioner of Permits and Legation, Jason Hessler, Assistant Commissioner uh, Erica Yates of our Code Enforcement and Emergency Management, and Deputy Commissioner of Home Ownership and Housing Preservation, uh, Nicole Hart, as well as our Legislative uh, Director and Liaison, Stephanie Murdoch. Um, you know, DHCD stands by our bill report. We're in support of the council's efforts to learn more about our current um, strategies uh, to address mold in buildings. We recognize the importance of creating uh, healthy homes that curb um, environmental hazards, that lower asthma triggers, and that limit trips uh, to the emergency rooms and reduce uh, numbers of school and work days that are missed. Uh, mold is, you know, currently at this moment, um, it is not a violation in any of the federal, state, or local codes. Um, and we know from our work that um, our owner occupied and rental housing, that interior environmental quality is an important component of achieving um, healthy homes, as I mentioned um, earlier, and that mold spores may impact um, the family's health and physical well-being. Our code enforcement division uh, enforces the city's housing, zoning, building, and related codes. Um, you know, as it relates in terms of the uh, complaints for appearances of mold, uh, like water stains, um, the you know a visual appearance, or etc. Um, you know, we'll issue a violation notice to the property owner uh, for sanitary violations or um, look at some of the underlying components that could be uh, supporting the appearance of mold growth, like a defective wall, leaking roof, um, or any type of, you know, water or moisture uh, infiltration into the home. Um, we do not test mold. Um, you know, we may advise a um, homeowner or a property manager to um, hire a private mold testing uh, firm to determine the type and cause of the mold and take steps to remediate. We do have several programs through our Division of Home Ownership and Housing Preservation that can assist um, both uh, homeowners as well as, in some instances, uh, renters with um, our Healthy Homes dollars through our Lead Hazard Reduction Program as well as our Weatherization Assistance Program and our rehabilitation program that can support um, eliminating and uh, reversing some of the negative housing conditions that can contribute uh, to possible mold growth um, in the house. So overall, we uh, support uh, the bill, we support investigating this further, and uh, we're happy to answer any questions today. Thank you. We're going to go to the Housing Authority. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Monica Watkins. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer for the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. I have today with me uh, Raymond Agnet, who's our environmental engineer, uh, who oversees the enforcement of our operating order for addressing any suspected fungal growth or mold. Uh, we have our legislative liaison, Crystal Hippolyte, and we have um, Bill Peach, William Peach, who is the uh, Senior Vice President of Administrative Services and um, helps uh, to navigate a lot of issues that may be reported to the Housing Authority if there are complaints. So there was a lengthy memo that was sent, and so I don't think uh, I need to read that in its entirety, but we'll summarize <clears throat> by saying that there is a difference in how our complaints are addressed between public housing and the Housing Choice Voucher Program. I'm mainly going to speak on how we address it in public housing. Uh, we have a robust uh, inspection program and training program for all of our uh, maintenance staff and those who supervise the maintenance staff. This is an annual uh, training that they go through, a biannual training that they go through with uh, periodic refreshers um, over time. 
The Housing Authority takes any uh, complaints of suspected fungal growth or uh, any um, actual mold complaints very seriously. We have, um, upon becoming a resident with the Housing Authority of Baltimore City, we do provide information to the residents as to how they can prevent uh, any kind of uh, such growth or how they are responsible for reporting uh, that growth uh, or any kind of leak, rather, uh, that happens within the unit. And it's important to, impo uh, to report these um, issues very quickly so that our staff can assess the situation uh, and make uh, steps to um, remediate anything that, that is uh, as a result of a leak. Uh, if, if residents don't report it, then um, the situation can persist longer than it needs to and create uh, situations. In addition, we have a robust inspection program. Um, what that means is that we have our in-house inspection uh, team that goes around to units and takes a look at um, Every, the condition of the units, including if there are any unreported leaks or conditions that will support mold or suspected fungal growth. We have an inspection contractor that helps us prepare for a HUD, um, our annual HUD inspections. Well, and that, that allows us to get ahead of anything that um, may rise as an issue for what we're responsible for, uh, for our HUD inspections. And then we have the HUD um, inspections, which are now transitioning, but they were called REAC inspections. And so with those REAC inspections, um, a third party hired by HUD comes out and takes a look at the unit, and of course, they will um, alert us as, as to if there are any issues with um, suspected fungal growth. And then um, on the fourth tier, we have uh, an annual housekeeping inspection. And we've also piloted a housekeeping liaison um, in the last few months. So with the annual housekeeping inspections and with that liaison, we have more eyes on our properties and our units than we would uh, typically have so that we can address anything that may come up as an issue. So um, we are completely in support of making sure that we have measures and metrics and also um, plans in place to address anything that may arise. But um, we're, we're partners in this with our residents, so, and we absolutely want them to have safe, decent, and affordable housing, which includes um, addressing any issues with suspected fungal growth or mold. Thank you, and thanks for the thorough report. We are going to move on to our health department who has a presentation that they're going to share. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning and good morning to the members of the committee. My name is Julia Roche. I'm the Legislative Affairs Director with the Baltimore City Health Department. I am accompanied today by my colleague, Margaret Schnitzer, who is the Director of our Community Asthma Programs. Um, and she is going to share a PowerPoint now that will um, both explain how the health department is, uh, you know, related to this issue and will also, um, I think, help support and clarify what has been shared uh, by everyone else um, in terms of, you know, the challenges around addressing mold. Good morning. My name is Margaret Schnitzer, and I'm going to just talk a little bit about uh, mold and how the health department deals with it. Oops, I can figure out. Uh, okay. So according to the CDC, um, mold is pretty much everywhere. So it occurs naturally. It's common. You find it indoors. You find it outdoors. Um, it can enter homes through the, oh, we've lost it. Um, is that me? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, it can enter homes the way other things enter homes, through doors, through windows, through heating ducts and air conditioning ducts. Basically, it grows where there is moisture. So if you think about a house, there's moisture. Um, if there are leaks in roofs, if there's leaks in plumbing, um, windows, uh, or leaks around pipes. Um, and it grows on things that are porous, um, which makes, sometimes makes it very difficult to get rid of. So like paper, cardboard, carpeting, those kinds of things. Mm. Oh, 
Okay. Ah. So what are the health effects of mold? Well, a lot of people have already kind of re referred to them. Um, it can cause a variety of health effects. Many of them are respiratory. They are very different from person to person. So people can experience like a stuffy nose, sore throat, coughing, wheezing, burning eyes, or a skin rash. For people who have asthma or who are allergic to mold, there can, there can be uh, severe reactions uh, and severe asthma attacks. Um, for people who are immunocompromised, who have chronic lung disease, mold has the potential to cause infections. But there are also some people who have no reaction to mold. Um, we currently have no standards for mold that indicate what levels of mold are harmful. There's no state laws, there's no federal laws, which makes it incredibly difficult for us to address and for, for enforcement purposes. It, mold investigation and remediation are a specialized skill set. And if the Health Department's Bureau of Environmental Health were to build the skill set required, testing for mold would not be meaningful since the results from testing have no threshold with which to compare them and as well as the fact that individual health responses vary. So it doesn't mean that we're not concerned about mold because the health department is concerned. It can be a trigger for symptoms, particularly for kids with asthma, which is who we deal with. Um, our community asthma programs conduct home visiting for kids diagnosed with asthma. Um, because, and because mold, among other things, can exacerbate asthma symptoms, anytime we suspect mold, it's a concern. If mold is suspected, um, we review the causes, the potential causes with family, and if there's appearance of mold, we refer our families to the Department of Housing and Community Development for further inspections into the source of the moisture. Um, without the source of the moisture being identified and remediated, basically, mold growth will be an ongoing problem. When we're talking about how many cases of mold or what our call volume is, the Bureau of Environmental Health receives between 10 to 15 calls per week from constituents requesting that we investigate their rental property for mold. Uh, the Environmental Health Bureau informs renters that the, health, that the housing department can investigate structural issues that might be causing moisture intrusion and provide constituents with the phone number of housing to redirect them. Similarly, our asthma program refers between one and two clients every week to the DHCD for an investigation of potential mold. So because of the challenges in addressing mold, uh, House Bill 976 work group on mold standards and remediation was just passed at the state level, and we're very excited about this. This work group, which is made up of experts, will study information on mold assessment and remediation to determine best practices for identifying mold, prevention of mold within indoor environments, and remediation of mold believed to be harmful to the public health. The work group will report their findings and recommendations to the governor and the General Assembly by October 1st, 2024. Um, so thank you. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We're going to move on to our, our law department. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is Sophia from the Mayor's Office of Government Relations. The Law Department stands by its support and um, afform, approves the, the bill for form and legal sufficiency. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna move on to questions from um, committee members, also the bill sponsor, um, Council Member Burnett, who is here today. I have a first question, I'm gonna to get to our sponsor. For the community asthma program, how does BCHD, how does the health department receive their referrals? So BCHD re receives referrals for our asthma program through a number of different resources. So we get information from the CRISP system, which identifies children who have been in emergency rooms for asthma. 
Um, we get them from primary care providers. We do outreach into the community so people can refer themselves. Um, we work with programs uh, inside and outside of the health department, so healthcare access which does a lot of work with young children, will refer children to us. Um, many of the programs inside the health department also refer to us. Um, so our lead program will also identify kids with asthma and refer to us. So um, pretty much any way we can think to find families who may be affected by asthma, um, we try to outreach and um, provide information about our services. Can you, can you elaborate on the, any type of referrals that are made by our school system, by city schools? Sure, so we work with, um, we do a couple of different things. So we work with school health, and every year we spend some time talking to school nurses about the services we provide. We provide them with um, posters that they can hang up in their health suite to promote our services so that families who visit or parents who visit the health suite can also see those posters. Um, we do receive direct referrals from school health services. However, it has to be, the parent has to agree. So there's a signed, um, there's requirement to have a signed uh, release of information so that they can refer their child. We will also be next year working with um, Johns Hopkins to actually put some more group services uh, within, the, within the schools um, and try to just have a larger presence in community schools so that people can take more advantage of our services. Thank you, and I actually have one other question. Um, Director Allen, this would be for you. Right now, we do not have an existing um, SR for mold, um, but our health department, they outline with their, within their report the amount that we're getting, which is fairly a decent amount of increase through the 311 service. Are there any barriers that what's the What's the feasibility to get some type of SR code within 311 for specifically for mold challenges within homes? So as any agency, if you wanted to request any type of service request, we work with you to develop the request by asking what questions you need answered to make sure that you can provide the best response. So basically, it's pretty simple. Um, we take our leads from the agencies in both developing service requests as well as um, they are responsible then for putting in the outcome, closing it, and sending the information back to us in case the customer calls back for a follow-up. So it's a fairly easy process, and we work with agencies all the time to develop new service requests. Okay, thank you. And I have just in... Um, Commissioner Kennedy, this is more so, a, this would be a follow-up um, for you. Obviously, that's just an easy, I just think that that's an easier way to just track that data point if we have an SR request um, option for mold. Um, because I saw the challenges that you outlined within your report about how you have to narrow down um, the councilman's question um, about how many 311 SR requests are coming through. My follow-up is that back in um, February of 2022, we had um, a similar, a very similar hearing asking a lot of the, the same questions. So I'm looking to see the Housing Authority let us know in this, in this report and also spoke about some proactive measures that they've actually taken since February 2022. Um, has anything changed since the February 2022 hearing with DHCD regarding challenges specifically for our residents for mold? Are there additional programming? Have we done additional educational outreach? Um, that was something that was brought up as well since that last hearing. I would say um, since the last hearing, one of the um, components is that uh, Erica, Assistant Commissioner Yates and her team are continuing to educate residents on, on mold in terms of when they are doing inspections and around um, interior inspections uh, specifically. Um, we have not done a educational series, but we can do this for uh, landlords and uh, like we could separate it out for both landlords and uh, homeowners uh, to provide additional um, education on where to find you know, resources or how to obtain testing. Um, but the inspectors are providing that educational information when they are out in the field 
already, um, but we can come up with a proactive uh, component to that. Um, we definitely, it is a more reactive because like we said, we get um, an SR that has the word, word mold in it. So we've done uh, the data and research. I know that Deputy Commissioner Hessler has more information on what we've seen in terms of those inspections. You know, we just um, worked with 311 to pull some data to see if where the word mold showed up in our um, SR types. We have, I think, 17 to 20 different SR types. Um, there were, in 20, calendar year 2022, there were 755 SRs that mentioned mold in reference to a fungal growth versus um, molding or, or some other construction type mold. Um, and that breaks down to 605 individual properties. In reviewing all those, um, the complaints are not solely for mold. Um, so as you read through it, um, the complaint comes in and lists multiple problems with the house. Um, so having a, a separate um, SR type for mold um, isn't really necessary. Like we are able to pull out and see where complaints for mold are coming in. And what it would end up doing is just increasing the number of SRs without and, and creating more work for the inspector in as far as paperwork to close out things just for the purpose of tracking something where um, we are able to do that word search and pull out and find where mold is. Um, but having that separate SR, what we'd end up seeing is people putting in for maintenance structure and then calling back and putting in for mold and then calling back and putting in for trash in the yard or something like that. Um, and it, it doesn't really, it's not really necessary in order to tr track and see how many people are calling about mold. And I do want to add that with the um, Office of um, the Division of Homeownership and Housing Preservation, that education around mold, um, appearance of mold, um, basically the healthy homes components of the work that we do, interior healthy homes components, ventilation, et cetera, that's done through those programs of lead hazard reduction, weatherization assistance, and office of rehabilitation. Okay. And um, Mr. Hazard, I just want to make sure I understand. So from the HCD standpoint, an, a separate SR for mold or the appearance of mold would not be um, helpful. It's, it's not necessary for what we're doing. Okay. Um, at one point in, in the 311 process, we considered reducing our SRs down to just two or three because when a housing inspector gets a call to go out with a, at a property, they're going out and they're looking for whatever violations exist. So even if the person doesn't say that the ceiling's leaking, if they're walking through the property and they see the ceiling leaking, they're documenting that and they're gonna cite that. So, um, you know, they we we do classify them, um, but really the same inspector is going out and looking for all the violations. Um, it, it really ended up just being a tracking issue to see like, how many vacant building calls came in versus how many rodent calls. But the same inspector is going out on all of those. Um, I think for the housing inspections, it's 17 different SRs, and they're looking for whatever violations exist, and they're not usually. They're not using the title of the SR. They're looking at what the person said, um, either to the operator or in or typed into the app or online, where they can do um, answer the flex questions and say, like, my complaint is about, um, you know, no hot water and rodents and a leaking pipe and mold, and so then they're they're going to check those things and capture whatever else exists at the property. Um, and the technology is such with 311 that we are able to like build a report and say out of all the HCD reports, how many times did mold show up? And it, it pulls out a list with all the SR numbers, all the addresses, all the information you would need if you, want, if you were gonna go in and kind of do some kind of data analysis. So having a separate SR isn't really necessary. Thank you. We're going to move on to Councilmember Burnett. You have the floor. 
So uh, I had a follow up on that. Um, so when the, it's my understanding, and maybe if, if I'm incorrect here, so when someone calls 311 about an issue, whatever the issue is, inspector come out, may come out and see that maybe there was a mischaracterization cat of the call, so maybe they report it as one X and the inspector says, well, actually this is Y, but we still see the violation. Uh, it's my understanding that a new SR is generated uh, with that new category or, or assessment. Is that, that, that doesn't happen? No, not, not generally. If it's an um, incorrect address. A new um, SR comes in. Sometimes, but usually if it's an incorrect address, they'll just close out the SR that was called in saying 123 Main Street doesn't exist and in their notes say violation appears to be at 125 Main Street and then they'll just go into our system and create a um, violation notice or citation depending on what the violation is. They won't go back into 311 and create another record because that record is just there to drive the inspector out to the property and we're already there. Um, we respond to over 60,000 service requests a year um, in addition to follow-up inspections and other complaints that come in other, other ways. So um, for the inspectors, managing the amount of quote-unquote paperwork is important because it takes away from actually being in the field and, and seeing what's going on. And while it may only take a few seconds, a minute or two to enter in an, an SR, it is, it's, it's just one more task added into there. So they won't normally do that. Well, I was asking that because um, clearly there's, I mean, I do think that there's value in having a categorization of at least the appearance of mold in the system. Because uh, someone, as you, you said, may, may call about a leak and then the inspector comes and sees the appearance of mold and perhaps that person didn't call that in as mold. They called about my leaky roof and perhaps they didn't know, notice the mold growth, but the inspector might and put that in their notes. Presumably, uh, and so I think that there's an opportunity. I mean, I think in that scenario, without that, we're, we may be losing the scope of how many complaints, and maybe it's not a large amount of them because I think most people can identify mold, but perhaps they aren't. I mean, it's not always very clear that there's mold growth, but the inspectors, having just uh, experienced enough, may say, "Hey, actually, I, I saw something that that wasn't reported," and put that in their notes. So I, I just think perhaps it could be helpful to track at least to some degree and a way to consolidate it um, so that it's just helpful for all of us, including the health department, to have a better understanding of where mold growth is happening. I mean, or if there's a, you know an issue in a, a multi-unit building. I mean, I'm looking at the HABC report and one of my questions was like, what happened in 21225? Because they were like, it's clearly an outlier of complaints in that one zip code, meaning that there's some sort of larger issue that I'm sure they address uh, or, or are addressing. So the, the inspectors are still and would be putting information in notes. Um, so I think I just not, you know, the 311, the, the client that's calling in or the customer constituent that's calling in to place the 311, um, they may call in and say, I have um, appearance of mold, a leaky roof, a broken furnace, and a, a window that won't work. And all of those are being noted in that 311 call now. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think, trying to also just get clarification. And if, the, if it's a call in and it's only around a leaky furnace or a leaking ceiling and the inspector goes out, they would do the interior violation if you know needed if needed that violation for the leaking ceiling or roof or window and furnace um, but they would put a note about appearance of mold um, in the note so i just i'm trying to get clarification on what at what point are you saying like it would be beneficial to have something be able to be put in the notes because it is already able to be put in the notes or well so the 311 data isn't just used by hbc it's used by the health department there's an open data website so if i wanted to compile a list if i wanted to go on the website that the city maintains that says i want to know how many mold complaints are in my zip code or in my neighborhood i wouldn't be able to pull that information because it's not 
in the 301 system. Right, but, but you're also not able to pull how many complaints there are on furnaces or hot water heaters or... Um, yeah, but that's not a public health crisis. <laughs> the, 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 the mold, the perpetuation of mold in my particular ge ge geography that I'm trying to get a picture of using our, the city re research that we're making available to people is just something that you can't track. I can. I don't know. If I want to no, track and how I, many, I, like, broken and I understand. There are, no, many. and I understand that. And I would say that a lot of the appearance of mold is going to be caused by the underlying issues of a leaky furnace, poor ventilation, broken window, uh, poor roof. Like from the infiltration of water and moisture and the inability to dry out areas, like is when you can typically see. Um, fungal growth um, or the appearance of fungal growth. So I think it's about getting a better understanding potentially and we could work through this um, to see what actually would make sense to try to be able to easier, like more easily capture. Right now, we can do that analysis based on, you know, knowing the number of SRs that we have with mold in the, somewhere in that and then get that data by zip code and neighborhood and go to the next level based on what the SR is. Um, but I think we'd have to have a little bit of a broader conversation to figure out exactly um, how best to um, be able to get to the data point that you're looking to be able to get to. Yeah, I mean, because my, my pushback would be, sorry, Madam Chair, yeah, would, go, would, go ahead. would be like, if my roof starts leaking today and I call 311 today, the inspector's not gonna see mold, right? But if I call about the leaky roof and after 48 hours or 72 hours when mold, when the water has been sitting there, then yeah, like it'll be in your notes somewhere. Um, but at no point is the, I think the data point is helpful for other agencies, research institutions, uh, advocates, who may want to see where the perpetuation of mold is occurring. And right now, the open data sources that we have made available to outside institutions for this purpose, would not, they would not be able to pull this information. Me looking at how many calls for a leaky furnaces is, is, is only gonna tell me so much about the situation because they could have easily just called as soon as the furnace started leaking, not necessarily after the water has been pooling in the basement for three or four days. You see what I'm saying? So I, I think the structural things are helpful to paint somewhat of a picture, but if in your notes you know how many inspectors have confirmed the appearance of mold, it just would be helpful for the rest of the public to know that too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think that the instead of an SR type, it may be a better as a flex question within the um, maintenance structure SR is for the resident to answer yes or no, is there the appearance of fungal growth or mold or, or something of that nature? Yeah, I think it'd be um, useful. I mean, the other yes. thing that comes to mind too is like bad landlords. Like if I wanna pull up addresses, this person owns 15 properties and now I can see that like all of them have mold complaints, that's something that may be useful for me as a perspective tenant to make sure I'm not moving into a property that like probably has water problems or if I'm moving into an area where there's like repetitive flooding I may want to know that information that hey this particular block has had this problem for X amount of time for Frederick Avenue you know the 5100 block um, you wouldn't know you wouldn't be able to piece that together from the available data yeah and I, th I think we're just trying to figure out exactly yeah. what and where it makes sense um, to be able to capture that in, in a way that um, works for the public, works for the um, process, works for 311, you know, the inspectors and how to like incorporate that component. Okay. Um, I had more questions, but I, I, I know I'm taking up a lot of time, so I want to step back. Councilman Conway, did you have any questions? No questions. Okay. Uh, go go ahead, Councilman Byrne. All right. Oh, no, yeah. no, go for it. If you guys You're good. You're okay. Good. So I had a couple. Um, my, I mean, my first was for HABC. Uh, what was happening in 21225 <laughs> that there was such an uh, outlier of uh, complaints? 
Uh, thank you for that question, Councilman. Th that's actually over um, 1,800 units that we're um, speaking of, so percentage-wise, it's, it's um, very small. But uh, like um, I shared, we um, have a robust inspection program. So anytime there's a leak, all of these were closed, were addressed and closed out. But anytime there may be um, a leak that is, um, that's not addressed uh, right away, that could be a cause for you know something to, to grow. Um, but as soon as we know about it, we have to work with our residents to report uh, issues. And if they, they, if they feel like they can address whatever's happening until it, it doesn't, um, until they can't do it anymore, then that's when we get those um, complaints. Also, um, it's likely that some of those may be repeated calls, so it's not, they're not unique numbers. That's calls for service, okay. Complaints received, yes, it says it right there, okay. Um, yeah, it's not confirmed how many were of these were confirmed. How many total, and maybe you may not have this on hand, how many total units does HABC oversee in the city? Oh, just, so um, just over 7,000 public housing units, and then uh, we have, of course, some privately managed properties that we also have an interest in, so if there are any issues that arise there as well, we're making sure they're addressed. Okay, um, and the, so the, the tr folks receive training. Uh, does the agency conduct mold testing? So when it, and there's a protocol, and I'll pass the, the um, mic to our environmental engineer, but it depends on um, what the original findings um, are. So uh, as I stated before, our team, all of our maintenance staff, plus our maintenance supervisors go through annual training. So there is a, um, a, a chart, a protocol chart that they follow. In the event that the maintenance team cannot um, address what the source of the issue is, uh, they then turn it over to our environmental engineer and then he takes it from there, so I'll let him speak. Um, to fill in what Monica says, we have a very detailed program in place at HABC to respond to mold, com mold complaints. Typically at the site, the trained staff will address 99% of the issues. Only when it gets to a certain level, which is what we consider large or extensive, and they can't handle it, then they call me in and I will assist them in doing air sampling sometimes. I will go a little deeper and try to find the source of a, a, a moisture intrusion issue. And if necessary, we will do abatement of the mold of whatever is happening to render the unit safe again. Okay. Um, and the, the other final question I had for you all was, uh, it, it said in your report that you don't track chronic mold. Um, what's the, the rationale for that? So every um, complaint that comes in, and, and this is our, our legal team really defining chronic. So we, what we track is every issue that's reported to us. Um, there's, there's nothing that says, okay, this is a chronic issue because we're addressing it and abating it at that time. So there was no, there's no, um, just like we presented these numbers, there's nothing separating them to say, okay, this was a chronic issue. It's just an issue. Right, but you are tracking like how many times you're coming to it. Yes, so we could piece that together. If you had to come to a, a particular unit ten times, then you've come. You we know, we have yeah. that work order system, and yes, we are able. That's why I said if some of those are not unique, okay. um, then that's we absolutely have that information. Okay, and are your pro the protocol is that public information? Is there somewhere that we could uh, find that, or if you could send it to the committee? Just I the, believe our, our legislative liaison sent that at the February meeting. Okay, I'm out on the committee. I'm sorry, I wasn't here. Oh, okay. <laughs> but if you go but we can have that, it. We've talked before, Crystal. Thank you. Um, okay. I'm sorry for the side conversation. Um, I was also noting that once a resident moves into the property, they receive the protocol as well to be um, you know, educated on what mold looks like and what they should do in the event they see something. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Um, Commissioner um, Kennedy, in that last hearing, um, I believe it was Deputy Commissioner Booker who spoke about um, our investigators, and I think the last report that you guys issued let us know, hey, our investigators are not trained um, to identify mold. They can speak to like the appearance of mold, but there is no training on mold. Has anything been explored about providing um, training to our investigators? No, so in order to, um, that's not just, you know, training on the appearance, you cannot determine mold unless it's tested. Um, and so that would require not just training on testing and procedures, but um, also being able to provide mold testing kits and uh, laboratories to turn those around and all of the other components of that. Um, so we have not gone into that stage. I mean, at this point, mold is not a, um, as, as stated, it is not a federal, there are no kind of federal, state, or local standards around um, what determines to be any um, dangerous levels of mold or, or, or what you would see, and it is also not currently um, a violation, a local violation, something that we can uh, create a violation notice on for that. So we have not um, taken any steps, um, and in this time would not take any steps um, to provide training or testing on those. That's outside of the scope of the work of the inspectors. So if they're able to identify, say, the appearance of mold when they're going through or just making a note of the appearance of mold, what is there any type of training to just say, hey, this because it can be, we know that sometimes something can look like mold, but it may be something else. But what type of training are they provided at all? Or let's just say to speak about any type of training that our investigators are provided regarding mold in general? There is no training specific to mold um, because as stated, you can, the only way that you can determine if there is mold is to conduct a test. So anybody can only see there is an appearance of some type of growth or whether or not that be mold, mildew, um, actual mushroom, I've seen mushrooms actually growing out of um, a carpet in a building. Um, so there is no training specific to mold or the appearance of mold. Um, Assistant Commissioner, do you want to talk a little bit just in terms of the overall uh, training that relates to interior maintenance code? Good morning. Thank you. So when we, for training, can in you general, just just for the record, can yeah. you just state your first and last name and just the agency you're with? Yes, Erica Yates, uh, Assistant Commissioner for Code Enforcement Inspections. So just to speak on training in general, um, not just for interiors, but um, we have a trainer on site that does all of our training. So um, anything for interior property maintenance inspections, that trainer trains all the inspectors on what to identify, how to identify, and when to identify a violation. Um, in regards to mold or the appearance of mold, um, again, there's no training to say, yes, this is mold, but what we do is if we do see something that can appear to be mold, the inspector do um, cite for that. Uh, we'll cite for general nuisance. And then in our description, we'll put appearance of mold. So therefore, when the owner or the responsible party receive that violation notice, they know that, yes, it's a, uh, some type of growth in that property that needs to be addressed. So at that point, the owner is responsible for um, going out and getting that tested. So when we come back, we want to make sure that, okay, you did get it tested. Um, that violation notice will not be abated until we identify that it's not mold, it's not a danger or a health threat to that tenant or occupant to that property. And that's why it's a broad, it's under a broader citation because we can't cite specifically uh, for mold. And thank you, Assistant Commissioner Yates. Um, I have one final question. Um, can you go over, yeah, we did, we went over this in the hearing, it's in the report, 
but just for the record, can you go over the programs, elaborate on the programs, the grants, the loans, any other assistance that DHCD um, may provide residents to abate mold issues, underlying issues, um, and make related repairs? Yep, so I would start with um, the Office of Homeownership and Housing Preservation. The um, General Office of Rehabilitation covers a broad range of, of loan and grant programs available to um, assist with a number of different components within the house, whether or not that be windows, roofs, doors, porches, uh, exterior work, retaining walls, fences, you name it. That's the most broad category we have. Um, that is and has uh, income restrictions up to 80% area meeting income um, and it you know we but that would be a program that could be available for assistance our weatherization assistance program also has a component um, through that program that looks at um, home health and safety and, and healthy homes uh, work a lot of that focus historically with the weatherization program has actually been on increasing like bathroom ventilation. So that's an area of focus by the state that you know there was a push on um, and feds on changing kind of interior ventilation around bathrooms typically where you might have more increased moisture. Also basements, uh, waterproofing can kind of call, come into play as well through that healthy homes aspect. Because if there are items in the home like water in a basement, we can't actually do the weatherization work if there is standing water or water infiltration. So the water infiltration would be taken care of um, through the healthy homes component of that work. Um, same thing with uh, any mold remediation. We also have sometimes also had to do asbestos remediation through that as well. Lead hazard reduction is the same, where um, there is dollars available. The main in, you know, way to get into that program is children under the age of six in the home, and then there would be lead hazard testing if there's lead in the home to be um, addressed. And then through the healthy homes component of that, if there was mold or the appearance of mold, um, the appearance of mold and then the healthy home, homes component of that could help with testing and then remediation of, of that. It also looks through in the healthy homes check off, you know, check boxes, et cetera, ventilation in bathrooms, kitchens, basement um, areas, appearance of any water infilt infiltration, roof, leaky roofs, um, and those things can be covered under those healthy homes dollars that are available for a lead hazard case. Thank you, Commissioner Kennedy. Um, Council Member Burnett? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, sorry, Assistant Commissioner uh, Yates. Can you walk me through one more time? The, you said that there was a, the issuance of a violation, and if I understood you said it was the responsibility of the property owner to remediate that. Could you just walk, walk me through that part again? Sure. So when the inspector received a 311 complaint, the 311 complaint could be for interior inspection. Uh, we'll go out, we'll meet with the tenant, uh, we'll go in, um, the tenant could say, oh, I have mold or I have a leaky ceiling, whatever the violation may be or the issue may be. So we'll go out, um, if we do observe the appearance of mold, what the inspector would do is they'll take the photo, come back into the office, um, apply their data entry into the, our, our computerized inspection system, um, and that violation for appearance of mold is what we call general nuisance. But in our description, so the owner would know what the general nuisance is, we'll put appearance of mold. That gives that owner or responsible party um, the idea of what needs to be fixed. We'll make contact with that owner or responsible party, let them know that we identified the appearance of mold or, and or we identified the source of, a possible source of where that growth came from. And it's up to that owner or responsible party to get tested to say, yes, it is a threat, no, it's not a threat. We cleared out the violation before that notice would be abated by our inspectors. So we will have to get those steps. We'll have to see that, yes, they got it tested. Yes, they correct the violation. They, you know, remove the mold or they cleaned off the, wherever their source is. 
or they, they abated that violation notice prior to the inspector coming out um, so that that notice can be um, abated. So they have to show proof of testing? Yes, we will ask for that. Okay. Um, and are there, so I, I just think back, we had a, a, an individual um, that your office was helping us with at, at a multifamily unit uh, that the landlord just painted over the mold. Uh, we weren't aware that they were ever asked. I'm not saying they weren't, I just mm -hmm. wasn't, I, this is the first time hearing that they would be asked to provide proof of testing. Yes, Are there, yeah. is there sort of a standardization of which like the testing source must come from a certain type of entity? Like, can you walk us through like what they're looking for? So we will, I'll, I'll give an example of a apartment building that we did go out to and the tenant did um, express some mold or spurs and then that property manager did show us, we got it tested by the, a private company and they showed us it was no threat um, again, I don't know what the rams of what sure. are, right, but we do allow that private contract or private uh, department to let us know it's no threat, it's not enough sparrows or however they call it, to say that it's a health threat to the tenant. And if we do get those, um, that document, or we speak to that, con that uh, company, then we can come back out and abate that violation notice. Okay, so let's, um, I wanna talk offline because mm -hmm. we had a particular situation where I don't recall that going in that direction. So okay. let's talk offline sure. and, and walk through no it. problem. I don't wanna go into the details here. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Okay, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm good. Thank you, um, Councilman Burnett. We're going to move on to public testimony. Um, if there's anyone who has joined us online, no one has signed up within the chambers, but any members of the public, if you're online, um, you will have three minutes each to provide your testimony if you wish to share. Um, and as a reminder, if you're in the council chamber and would like to testify, please sign in and check the appropriate box on the sign-in sheet just outside the door. If you've joined us through WebEx and you would like to testify, please use the raise hand function at this time to let us know. We're gonna check online to see if we have any folks who wanna testify at this time. Okay, we're not showing anyone online who is utilizing a function to testify. We're just gonna double check again. And that's going to conclude our public testimony for today. I do want to thank everyone for joining us um, within the chambers today, especially to our agencies um, throughout representatives. Um, the committee's gonna schedule a follow-up meeting in the future to get additional information and just continue this important discussion. Um, again, I, before we get out of here, I do wanna thank um, Council Member Burnett um, for his leadership on this issue um, and making sure that it's at the, the front. Um, this hearing is now in recess. Um, thank you everyone and have a great day.